can't see myself. Okay, good evening. I'm talking to a blind screen at this moment. Welcome to our meeting here. We're running a little bit late. We're having a few little difficulties, but bear with us. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, in order to limit any uh, interruptions or distractions from the speaker, we're asking everybody in the audience to uh, keep themselves mute and to keep your <clears throat> video off. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, now, if you have any comments or you have questions during the thing, use your chat, uh, your, your chat uh, service there. And if you're on Zoom, you can post your question on the chat. And, uh, and if you get disconnected by any chance, uh, you can rejoin by just going back to the original link that you used to get on in the first place. Now, if you're working with the Facebook, uh, you can post your questions on the comments on, and your comments on video, right? And we'd like you to uh, share your video with others so they can join in as well, all right? Now, behind, in, the back scene, in the back scenes, unknown to you, will be um, Mario and Carl. They're going to be moderating the material, keeping an eye on people coming in and leaving, and also wishing to ask questions or to make comments. So, excuse me. So, um, feel free to do it. You will, you will be dealt with, and your, your thoughts will be, it will be recorded. I have a couple of announcements to make to our members here, so bear with me, and we'll get into the, we'll get into the presentation very shortly. Um, to get through these rough times, it's necessary to uh, think positively. And though we all share a common interest in gardening and all the rest of it, we're not able to share a common location, except through this video, right? But um, hopefully the normal will return to us soon. Um, even though we can't meet, we can plan. And we've been very, very busy doing that. And we've been doing it in two particular ways right now that I'd like you to be aware of. First of all, we are continuing with our tropical plant fair. We don't know when it will happen. We know that we have it planned for the first weekend in March. And we're going to continue as if it will be done. We're taking a very positive attitude towards it. Um, we anticipate having maybe 40 to 50 exhibitors and uh, because of the economics and all the rest of it, we'll probably have in the neighborhood of 1,500 to 2,000 people show up. In other words, it will be pretty much, we expect it to be pretty much like it was the last time we had a successful uh, fair back in 2019. Excuse me. Uh, planning for the fair takes us time, but it doesn't take us any money, right? And I'm sure my members will be very happy to hear that, right? And the good news is that the club will have no expenses until we know it's a go. And that will probably be, we'll probably have a good idea about what's going on when in, uh, in January. Now, assuming we can know what's going on with the COVID uh, arrangements in January, that leaves us two solid months to actually implement the plans that we're making now. We can do this. We know that we're very confident we can do this and do it well. As a matter of fact, if we really get pushed, we could probably move and do it effectively all by the end of January. We need about three weeks at, at a minimum to, to implement what we're doing. So we're very, very confident on that. So we want you to keep a very positive attitude about us having a, a tropical plant fair this year because we sure as hell do. The other thing that we're doing is we're having the native plant, I'm sorry, the native orchid uh, project. Um, in the last month's meeting, we had 190 people who were very much interested in this topic. And a lot of people who showed uh, a, a, an interest in actually participating in it. Um, this idea is to go and bring in reintroducing native orchids into our public parks and into our neighborhoods and into our private gardens as well. Excuse me. Um, the board thinks this is a really great idea. We're very much enthused by it and we, and we, we want to encourage the development of this. Uh, as a consequence, what we have now is a, a, a native orchid committee the committee is there to go and help us organize ourselves so that we can actually do this project and do it effectively. Um, now we're going to be needing seedlings and we're going to be installed in the cities of Oakland Park 
and in Wilton Manor is to begin with. Hopefully we'll be able to even expand beyond that, but we will certainly start at that level. Now, the seedlings will run about $4 each. And as a consequence, the board is, the committee is looking at a, uh, an initial, uh, initial arrangement for around $5,000 in order to go and totally implement this game. Um, to pay for it, the committee is going to be raising funds through the next seven months or so, because we won't be getting the seedlings until probably early May, somewhere in that time. So it gives us seven months to raise the money. But in the meantime, we need to go and secure these seedlings, this order. And so we need to go and put a deposit, a 10% deposit down on the, uh, with the uh, Fairchild Garden. And they have asked, the committee has asked the board to act as a guarantor of the sales, basically. So, and after a lot of debate on the thing, we agreed that this was a good idea. We're not, uh, we're, we're not actually spending the money. What we're saying is, is that we're guaranteeing it, but we need to have the authority from the rest of the, from the club to be able to do that because it's over a thousand dollars. So as a consequence, because of our bylaws, we're going to be contacting you through our email and we're gonna be asking you to authorize us to do this so that we can get this off the drawing board and on, into our trees and into our parks. And I'm hoping very much that you, that you do pass this. We think this is a great idea. Uh, the board believes this project is a really good celebration of our 10th anniversary. We've been in existence for 10 years and for the last few years, we've been being very active with the kids in distress and butterfly gardens and elementary school supports and any number of different things. And we think this being our 10th anniversary, this would be a really, really uh, very proud to go and do that, to, to be sub uh, supporting this idea. It demonstrates the strength of our commitment uh, to improving the quality of life in our communities. And we really hope that uh, we're, we're all in accord on this particular one. The board, the board members, three board members have already joined onto this committee. And we're gonna be asking for others to join with them to give a, a broader perspective. Perspective. The members now are our treasurer, Mario, uh, Mario Rios. He's, the, he's going to be chairing the, the, this committee. Chuck Nichols will be on it as well. He's a former president and indeed a founding member of our group. He's very enthused about this. And our current secretary, Pat Elson, is also going to be on that. And we would like to have others join them. If you're at all interested in doing it, I, I urge you to contact Mayor Mario. You can do it right now. You can go on there, use your, if you're on Zoom here, you can use the, ch the chat and just make a note to Mario, to Mario and ask her, ask her any questions you may have of him. He'll be, he's in the background, as I and you know that. I'm gonna leave now. I'm going to introduce our friend, Carl Scherer. He's the vice president of programming. He's a, he's a guy that makes all these things possible. Um, tonight, uh, Mac Rivenbrook mm -hmm. uh, will be with us. Mac and his wife started their orchid business over 20 years ago after many fascinating trips to the Philippines. Through extensive study, Mac is considered an expert in Philippine and Asian orchid species and currently grows over 300 different varieties. Mac has served in our country as in the US uh, Marine Corps. He is past president of the Fort Lauderdale Orchid Society and enjoys giving lectures and educating others about orchids. For tonight, Mac will gather and show some amazing orchid plants that grow well in South Florida and will explain where and how to grow them here successfully based on years of information and advice from hundreds of large and private growers. Mac has an assortment of orchid species and hybrid plants for sale on his website, which can be located at asianorchidsource.com. During the presentation, please remember that if you're on Facebook or Zoom, you can ask questions either through chat or through Facebook, and we will be monitoring those so that we can uh, submit those to Mac at the end of the presentation. At this time, I'd like to introduce or turn this over to Mac Rivenbark. 
Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming this evening and, and listening to this lecture. Uh, I'm going to show some uh, orchids and stuff that I like to grow here in South Florida. Uh, my wife and I have been growing here uh, for over 20 years here in Fort Lauderdale. Um, we love growing orchids, obviously. Uh, we wouldn't be doing it for so long. It started out as a, a little hobby job uh, for myself. And uh, it was an orchid that I bought from my wife. And then I bought her another orchid. It was a birthday, holiday, something like that. Of course, I killed the first couple of orchids that you buy. And uh, nonetheless, I, I learned a lot more because she was pretty upset that I killed those first orchids. Uh, so I learned a lot more about growing orchids and um, started a small uh, collection. And the collection grew and grew until I have uh, tens of thousands of orchids at some times. Um, uh, we love going to orchid shows, but right now they're all canceled. So I've been doing lots of installations at people's homes. I've been doing some traveling and, uh, and uh, we've also been doing a lot of online sales. So I'm going to show some photos right here. I'm sorry I couldn't connect my computer correctly. Um, wow, that picture really is horrible. Isn't it? I wish it would come out better. But this is what everybody's looking for. Everybody wants to have, you know, tons and tons of flowers all at the same time. And uh, it just doesn't always work out that way as much as you'd like to uh, uh, want it to be that way. Uh, um, um, it, it takes a tremendous amount of orchids to have a lot of orchids flowering at one time, or you need to have orchids that last a long time. And there's different types of orchids that will last for many, many months in flower. And there's some that'll actually last five or six hours in flower once a year. Uh, this happens to be my favorite orchid. Um, this is Dendrobium anosmum. Uh, this has an incredible smell. Uh, this particular orchid was nine foot in length. My neighbor's neighbor could smell this. It was just absolutely incredible. Um, it has kikis on it. You can see over here, these are what they call kikis, little extra plants. And uh, this type of plant puts off a tremendous amount of, of those types of uh, extra plants. And uh, I like that. It gives you extra chances and uh, plants to give your friends also. Uh, this is uh, flowers up close. This is a gigantium variety of the Dendrobium anosmum. Uh, these flowers were almost six inches. It's a really large variety of it. Comes in many different colors, and uh, this is one mounted on some uh, on a tree. This one's called a Dendrobium knows from Touch of Class. This came out from Carmella orchids a few years ago. Really easy to grow. Really cool uh, uh, flower. Cerulea. Nice semi alba. And they also have a cerulea flower. Comes in an alba flower. All of these smell the same, but they grow and come from different areas. They come from many different countries. They grow at many different elevations. Now, the alba variety actually comes from an area in the Philippines called Rizal. And in that area, it rains all year. I think that's one reason the um, uh, large ones of these do not do well in Fort Lauderdale because people do not water them enough in the winter time. These actually still need to stay moist and not dry out for long periods of time. That's interesting. Carl, give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. No, I need to see your hands. Okay, I can see some hands. Thanks, Chuck. I saw your hands. Hi, buddy. Okay, just making sure you could hear me there. This is Dendrobium of Phylum. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's different than a Nosmum, but it grows very much the same. Has a tremendous amount of kikis also. Let me see if I can change this page to a better page. Yeah. Now that picture does really look horrible. Oh, there's a better. That's better, huh? Much better. Uh, this puts out a lot more kikis, so you get a lot more chances to grow this particular type of plant. It's not as fragrant uh, as the anosmum, but it's, it's surely easy to grow. It does not need a lot of water. Neither of these two plants need a tremendous amount of water. Uh, people will try to grow large plants of this and pot it up into larger and larger pots, and it's really not necessary. Uh, this plant does very well here in South Florida on low amounts of water, 
a lot of times just what we get by nature. Remember, those canes will be bare before they bloom. So you can see all these bare canes right here. That's what happens before you get the flowers. So don't think that's dead and cut it out of your tree because it, it, it doesn't look well. That's where a lot of your flowers come from on your dendrobiums. This one's called Dendrobium bellinianum. Uh, this one's a little different than a nosmum in the fact that it blooms over and over again on the same deciduous canes. This plant grows for two years, the leaves fall off of it, and then the canes start to form these circular clusters of about 30 flowers in a ball-shaped cluster. And it takes years and years for those clusters to hit every single one of those canes. Uh -oh. There's an up-close photo of it. Really spectacular. It's a very showy plant. You can really see this when it's outside on a tree. This is gold smidianum, and it's the same. It grows for two years, then it becomes leafless. These are just now getting pretty close to becoming leafless. Let me go back to that. And then um, it can be grown upright or it can or usually it wants to hang over. The canes will fall over uh, as it was in the Bellinianum. Uh, but this one was staked upright and had a couple thousand flowers on it when it won an award in judging. Dendrobium smileyi. And uh, you, you can't really see all the right at the ends. There's some pseudobulbs that have some flowers on it. It's almost three foot long. You can see by the ruler. This is a spectacular dendrobium, grows in bright light, uh, loves wind. The canes bounce up and down in the wind. That's what makes these canes nice and strong is the air movement that they get. Growing these inside of a greenhouse is not near as nice as growing them out in your yard. Uh, the wind uh, uh, air movement that they get make all the canes move so much more, more as they do in nature, so it makes them much stronger. Uh, growing this inside of a greenhouse, the canes don't, they don't get near as, as thick and as heavy as these do. Now, that's what the flower looks like. They call it the fish eye, uh, also the bottle brush orchid. It's a dendrobium smiley eye. It's cylindrical like a bottle brush and uh, almost the size of a small pineapple on large plants of this. Dendrobium aggregatum is really one of my favorites as far as color. The yellow and the brightness and the, the buttercup yellow that this produces is just fantastic. A lot of people call this dendrobium aggravation instead of dendrobium aggregatum. And uh, I think for the first couple of years, I did the same thing because I, I listened to what other people would say about growing orchids. And you have to be careful when you're growing orchids, listening to what other people say, because everyone has their own climate in their yard. Everyone grows uh, according to what they have. And, and I had a different kind of environment in my yard and the suggestion that was given to me to dry this plant out for months and months and give it as bright a light as I could, uh, that suggestion did not work for me. Some people can grow this orchid that way, but for me, it, it did not grow well. I, I don't grow these in pots. They don't do well for me in pots. I grow them in baskets and or on mounds here in South Florida and or on palm trees. They do great on palm trees. They don't need a lot of water. We get lots of rain here in South Florida. So the rain we get enough for this plant as long as it's getting wet from the rain. Remember, if something's planted on a palm, it may not be getting wet uh, uh, because of the palm protecting the palm tree from actually getting wet. So supplemental watering will be needed if you plant it on that type of a tree to make sure it is wet enough. Um, but these plants flourish here in South Florida and all we need is a little temperature in the 40s and these plants will bloom and grow very well for us here. I, I don't think drying them out for long periods of time or putting them in full sun is something that's needed. Thrissoflorum, this is Dendrobium thrissoflorum and um, spectacular dendrobium, very showy. On a small plant, you can get these giant clusters of flowers. This grows exactly as the aggregatum, and it grows the same as um, many other dendrobiums from Thailand. 
your farmeri, your densiflorum, thrissiflorum, aggregatum, all of these species all grow up in the mountains where it's nice and cool in the winter and dry and rainy and shadier in the summer. And that's very easy for us to give here in South Florida. You could plant this in a tree, give it a little water in the summertime and back up because this thing's gonna flower and do very well for you. Planting on palms and stuff, and this is actually a telephone pole. You can see at the base right there, that's a telephone pole. And um, we stapled lots and lots of plants all over this thing. Most of it was vandaceous plants. Vandaceous plants here in South Florida, some of the easiest plants to grow. Uh, one of the keys is bright enough. You have to have the plants bright enough. You can see here, there's full sun at a certain part of the day on this plant. And that's what they really like. Full sun for a certain part of the day. These are Mercaris and Arandas, and they're in full sun for most of the day most of the day in full sun. This particular one here is very common and is used in many, many hybrids. I think it's called JVB is the name of that. And it's used in lots and lots of Mokara and Aranda uh, and Arachnus hybrids um, because it's very floriferous, it's easy to grow and uh, flowers most of the year. attached to some trees. If it's too dark, notice you don't see a lot of flowers. It's just too shady. So you have to make sure you give it enough light. I watched, looked at these plants and informed the owner that we had to trim the trees in order to get some more light on these plants. It just was not enough light. I like using staples. Literally, you can staple them. It doesn't hurt the plant. It pulls the plant tightly to it. Plants have to feel attachment with a root and they have to feel very secure in order for them to flower. They're not going to flower unless they feel tight and secure to whatever they're growing on or attached to. I love Arides. This is called Arides Laurentiae. I think in Latin Arides is children, uh, like children dancing in the air, something like that. Um, puts out an enormous spray of flowers. This is the largest of all the Arides. Um, it's endemic to the Philippines, extremely fragrant. Uh, you can smell this all throughout your yard. And um, I like a lot of the different Arides plants. Here's another one of those. Uh, excuse me, that one's Odorata. This one's called Quin Cuvonera. You can see the Quin, the five colors around the outside. So that's why they call it Quin, plus the spotting in that. This is probably the easiest of all of the Arides to grow and flower puts out multitude of flower spikes and flowers, and it has a big red cinnamon fragrance, smells just like um, big red gum. Here's an Arides odorata, a big giant uh, Arides odorata plant. This is a Vandalamalata, and I, I love Vandalamalata that comes in five recognized color forms. And this is the Remediose color form. This is a combination in, in the wild, a primary hybrid that occurred naturally in the wild between regular Lamalata and Boxaliae Lamalata. It's a wonderful hybrid, primary hybrid. When you put two species together, that's a primary hybrid. Uh, this can bloom three times a year, loves bright light, doesn't need any care or much watering or fertilizing. It, it's a plant that thrives in the Philippines on small trees. Uh, uh, um, and we have lots of small trees here in South Florida. This is a spectacular, easy, easy, vandacious plant to grow here. And uh, it does come in a couple of different color forms too. The Boxalii, which is an alba color form. This is an Ascocinda. And I like growing Ascocindas because they put out tremendous amount of flower spikes and lots and lots of flowers. When Ascocinda is crossed with a Vanda, you get Asco, excuse me. When Ascocentrum is crossed with a Vanda, you get Ascocindas. And this is an Ascocinda. Uh, I like the orange plants that are Vandacious. They flower often, extremely easy to put in your uh, uh, garden and stuff here on small trees in bright filtered light. Uh, can take three or four hours of bright full sunlight every day and um, are tough hardy plants. 
uh, that don't need as much care and uh, um, as larger, more uh, larger, more uh, uh, large flowered vandaceous plants. A lot of your ascocindas are much easier plants to grow and flower here in South Florida. They're tougher, they're hardier plants, and they don't need as much care. If you like big flowered vandas, I, I recommend something blue. Uh, um, something blue in it's going to have um, a vanda in it, vanda cerulea. Vanda cerulea goes to 40, 45 degrees in the wintertime naturally in nature. Here in South Florida, we get 40, 45 degrees every year. So if you have a vanda cerulea, this particular vanda in the background of your plant that you own, you have a better chance of it withstanding the cold weather. Uh, there's lots and lots of gorgeous vandas out there, um, but they will not take the cold weather here in South Florida once it starts getting uh, down in the uh, upper 30s and the lower 40s. Uh, but if it has blue in it, if it's got a lot of blue in it, your chances are much better. So go for those large blue vandas. I recommend them much more. Um, this is a giant vandaceous plant called Vandopsis lysacoides. And um, I'm sorry, I don't have this connected because I have a huge plant of this outside that I wanted to show, but I was unable to move everything outside because of the rains that we had. So I'm just gonna be able to show the flower, but the plant I have is, it's about five foot tall and about three foot across. It looks like a giant Vanda. And the flower spikes about five foot long with, I think there's 26 of these flowers on it right now. Trichoglottis, there's a lot of wonderful trichoglottis that grow here in South Florida quite well. I, I believe we grow about nine different species of trichoglottis. This one's called Philippinense variety dark, where it's all dark. And uh, um, usually Philippinense is very spotted and speckly and, and very different. Uh, but this one's called variety dark, rather rare. This one's called Brachiata. And this is the one that most people really like. The color is so striking. And, and uh, the lip on them, all of them are very different though. Some can have a lot more white, more pink, spotted, um, fantastic flower. That's about a two inch flower if you're wondering about the size of it. Um, it can grow into a massive large plant though. It likes to blow in the wind. So tying these to a totem or something like that usually doesn't do so well. It, it likes to move back and forth in the wind. Uh, um, so uh, tying these and, uh, to palms and letting them grow off of palms is a wonderful idea. Here's a small plant my wife and I had uh, that, we, uh, that we got one time. So they can get what, quite large. Uh, Renanthras are incredible plants. If you like red, uh, Renanthras can't be beat. Um, we have grown some of these up to nine foot uh, tall and uh, uh, had to cut them because the flower spikes were hitting the top of our pool enclosure. And so we cut the plants in half and then um, uh, regrew them all the way back up again to the top of the enclosure and uh, cut them again and regrew them all the way back up into the enclosure. So they're very fast growing and uh, can flower for five, six months of the year without a problem. They need bright light though. That's the key for renanthras. Without bright light, they don't do well. So there's a couple of different species and uh, they've been mixed together to create some incredible different types of these. This one's a Trichoglottis uh, bravamica var rosea. Uh, they've changed the name on this a couple of times. Uh, we've actually had this plant uh, awarded three different times, three different awards on three different plants, uh, all of them being cultural awards. Um, uh, one of them, we had over 2000 flowers on one of these plants. It's truly a, a, an incredible plant when it gets to that size, a good three to four foot long with just thousands of flowers on it. Uh, this was one of my best blooming clusters uh, and um, just a vine-like plant that's very easy to grow here in South Florida. Not enough people grow uh, paphiopetalums here. I think it's a misunderstood plant, uh, why people don't grow them. Uh, people don't water them enough. That's the key. They like to be wet. Here in Florida, it rains all the time. So if it rains, you don't need to water these plants. So it's kind of back and forth. Do you water them or not water them? 
Uh, for me, I'm always watering these plants if it doesn't rain. If there's a tremendous amount of rain here, I, I can go days and days without watering them because they're potted in a mixture that holds moisture. And that's really the key. Making sure that you're potting in the right type of mix for your type of watering. If you're only going to water once a week, you need to use a media that's going to hold much more moisture so that these plants can stay wet. If you're in your garden every day and, and you notice this plant is dry, you can water it. If you're not going to be giving it that kind of attention, you need to be using something that will hold the moisture a longer period of time. They're very easy plants to grow. I think they're just misunderstood. Schimberkias are incredible. I, I love growing Schimberkias. They take an enormous amount of light. They put off uh, extremely long flower spikes. Um, this is a picture showing the, the undulation of the flowers, how they're all twisted and crooked. And that's usually what you get with the Schimberkia flowers. They do make wonderful hybrids with Cattleyas. It, it is in the Cattleya family or the Leila family, excuse me. Um, extremely easy plants to grow if you have them in enough light. Grammatophyllums are incredible plants to grow. They put off enormous flower spikes, three, four foot long, up to 15 foot long on the speciosum variety of Grammatophyllum. This one's called Grammatophyllum scriptum variety citrinum. And a lot of people have these blooming right now in, in their yards and stuff, especially if they've they bought one from me. And uh, these are just spectacular plants to grow. They can really see these flowers from a long distance. There's a large plant right there. A friend of mine uh, let me post this photo, show this photo. That is one plant that is behind her. So truly spectacular. Comes in a lot of different colors, but most of the colors are in the browns and greens. So varied, but not that varied. This one's called Mesurianum, and this one's uh, my favorite color. Uh, this one to me is the brightest and the, the most uh, uh, has the most variety to it. Phalaenopsis are incredibly easy to grow in your landscape here in South Florida. And I think a lot of people just don't plant them correctly. Uh, I've had uh, some, some great practice with planting those in some landscapes here in South Florida. Uh, one of the plants that I like the most is this particular one, uh, Phalaenopsis schilleriana. Uh, this is the queen of all Phalaenopsis. It's used extensively in hybridizing. Uh, on a large plant of this, you can, you can have hundreds of flowers on a inflorescence on a large plant of this. Um, it's, the plant is downwards, it's not upwards. Uh, as you see in Home Depot, the, the way the plants are grown there, uh, people will say they're a low light plant when they're, when they're positioned in that way because the leaves are pointed upwards. Um, the leaves on fails don't, uh, don't grow in that particular direction. They, they're actually sideways. Now, I wish I could be out in my nursery and show you right now. That's what I mean is sideways. They're, they're not straight up and down. They're not, they're, they're, they're up and down uh, uh, across. They're even with the tree. Against the tree is the best way to grow them. Equestrius is a fantastic species. It's not grown enough here in South Florida. It thrives here. And at the end of the flower spike, it puts out an extra kiki. So you don't cut the flower spikes on these. These can actually bloom year round. And it does come in a couple of different colors. And uh, I really like Equestrius. It's a plant that's not grown enough in landscapes here. It's, it's a very, very easy plant to grow. I'm showing a couple of plants here on mountings. I can't remember why I put this one in here right now, but that shows a tree on a flat mount right there. And um, you want your plants to grow in every direction when you plant something. You want something, the orchid to be on. It's on the limb. It's not into the limb, sorry. It's on the limb. So it grows the same on an orchid pot, not in the orchid pot. It's actually growing on the surface, not in the surface. So this is an Oncidium spatulatum. It's another Oncidium spatulatum. These are fantastic for landscapes here in South Florida. 
incredibly easy to grow here. Take divisions of a plant like this and, and decorate many trees around your yard. These usually flower in the March uh, time. Notice it's growing on the limb. That's actually how uncidiums should be grown, tied to a limb. It's very, very easy to grow them that way. Notice the cymbidium is growing off the limb. Notice how it's growing off right here. Oh, sorry about that. Technical difficulties. See how it's off the limb? That's not what you want. That, that cymbidium is not going to do well. This is a cymbidium alifolium. Fantastic flowers. Really beautiful. It's flowering nicely now. But everything that's growing off in this direction is going to start doing very poorly. Everything that's growing in this direction is going to do extremely well. That's why you can see the big flower spike on your left and not much on your right. There's nothing to attach to on the right, and it's rooting here on the left. So this plant should have been twisted this direction and planted against that way. Something more like this. See how it's growing on? That way you have a tremendous amount of flowers all the way around. You get that... Uh, uh, Starship, uh, starfish growing, excuse me, starfish growing. Uh, it's a picture of my daughter here. Cymbidium finlacionianum is the cymbidium that I recommend. It puts out a five-foot flower spike that's pendant, hangs downward. These are fantastic to grow here in South Florida, and they're easy plants to divide and move around your property into different trees once they get really large. Uh, but these can be huge. We've had these with 15, uh, 20 flower spikes on them. Uh, quite tremendous plants. These are some uh, mounts that I did on some plants up in the uh, uh, Boca area. This is a Dendrobium spectabile. This is a wonderful Dendrobium uh, that blooms uh, in the February, March time. I gave it a nice tight at the bottom. I tied it tightly here at the bottom. I added some moss for it to attach to, and I attached it loosely at the top. And that's the way I do most of my installations when I tie to trees. At the bottom, it's gotta be very, very tight so that the, and it's secured to the tree. It's growing actually towards the tree. The new growth is actually in the back over here towards the tree, not growing off of the tree. A lot of time when people plant orchids mount orchids on trees or actually even on pieces of wood, they actually plant them on their backwards. Uh, uh, um, this small part here is the old growth and this is the new growth, the largest. So the largest part of your orchid needs to be against the tree and the smallest part needs to be off of the tree. That way it's growing towards the tree, not away from the tree. And that, that really is opposite of what I see most people doing. Uh, that's a giant Luigi Fuchs there in the back that I installed on that tree with a zip tie. And uh, I turned the whole plant sideways and just zip tied it right to the palm. And the whole plant just turned sideways. And then over time, it started growing up towards the sunlight. Here's another demonstration. Tightly at the bottom, not touching the pseudo bulbs. You don't wanna to touch anywhere in here because that's where all your new growth is going to come from. You can notice the new growth back on this far side over here. It's tied loosely at the top, just so that it doesn't, all the weight uh, doesn't uh, uh, put all of the weight of those leaves onto the new mount. And uh, you have your new growth and everything right here against the tree. Let me blow this up so you can see it so it's not so clear, a little clear. You can see the new growth is against the tree right here and you can see all the new roots that are coming out right there against the tree. Right, so, so I, I like that. using this kind of yarn. I mean, this kind of string or rope, it's almost the same exact size as the roots. This rope in a year turns colored because of the uh, uh, lichen and stuff that's on this tree. And it's, it actually looks like roots after some time. Uh, so I'm able to cut this uh, upper string off up here and leave this bottom one on for a year until the plant attaches quite well. And you, you can't even see this string after a few months. It looks like other roots because there's so many roots growing over the top of it. Let's see if I can resize. 
I'll sometimes use material, nylon stockings. This is a shade cloth material that I used on this particular orchid and the one in the background over here. Uh, these are Dendrobium nobiles. And uh, I wanted to uh, put a little bit of sphagnum underneath these uh, so that they had some good moisture growing in the summertime. These are on Robolini palms. And if you uh, 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 plant something on a Robolini palm, you got to remember there's not a tremendous amount of water that gets to this unless it rains really hard. It has to rain really hard for this to get wet. Uh, great place to grow cattleyas, though. You can see the cattleya that I planted up over here. So I used the same material on both sides. I wrapped it around the cattleya and around this plant. And um, that worked extremely well uh, uh, on both, both of these robolinis. That worked really well. It's another demonstration where I tightly across the bottom, tightly across the roots to secure it. I didn't touch the new part of the plant. The new part of the plant is close to the tree and able to be mounted on it. I secured across here, not too tightly, and I left some loose. So that's the way you want to do it. You don't want to cover, let me go back here. You don't want to cover any part of this part. That's where your new growth is going to come out. You have to be careful with all of that part in there. Anything across here, you have to be very, very careful on your orchids. Uh, uh, that's the part that grows on something. So if you're going to pot this orchid in a pot, that's what you're going to see. All of that on the top of the pot. Every, all the roots where the rope is uh, will be on the, in the bottom of the pot or in the pot, excuse me. You can see quickly, in, in no time at all, the roots develop onto this. And uh, that's another demonstration of how I tied a cattleya. This is a cattleya uh, that I tied to a, a palm tree. Love vanilla. Vanilla is a fantastic plant to grow here in Florida. Um, it's extremely easy to grow. I can show you how I did one here. Here on the right in the bottom is a, is a planter. It's a two foot long planter, six inches tall, four inches wide. I filled it full of really good potting soil, high quality potting soil. And I mounted this small uh, piece of vanilla here. This was about a three foot piece. There's a two foot uh, a foot into the bucket here, into the soil, and then this piece coming up right here. And I think I have a second photo. No, nope. I don't have a second photo. I put a second piece on the other side of this uh, palm here. And uh, in less than two years, uh, yeah, there it is. So over 20 foot tall in less than two years. And I, I believe it had flowers on it when I was here at this time. Yeah believe somewhere it had flowers on it but in, in two years it, it grew 20 foot so super bright light that's in a half a day of full sun on a large on a large queen palm and um you can just see the uh, uh there's that container right there that i was talking about let me blow that up you can see the where the soil is it's still in the soil it's still connected to the soil and you can take this take these off take them down and start new plants and you can have this growing all over your entire yard every palm you have you can uh, uh, grow these on extremely easy plant to grow uh, no watering no fertilizing nothing was done to this plant and it grew 20 foot in less than two years um, okay Right, that's going to end the uh, slide part of my program. I'm going to turn the camera around. I don't know how much more time I have left. You can uh, send questions to me if you want at this time. I'm not right. sure if he's going to text those to me. He's probably going to have to text those to me to get those questions to me. Yeah, uh, growing yeah. orchids here in South Florida. Um, you want to plant your orchids before June? I don't like planting any orchids on out in nature here after June. And uh, I think I can go ahead and take you outside for a minute and show you some of my orchids outside. Since it's not raining now. Mac, can you hear me? We are live on Facebook. Oh, nice. Mac, can you hear me? some of my giant uh, plants that are out in my yard. These are big, giant Aerides plants with big flower spikes on them. These look giant, giant. 
talked about those earlier. Schimberkias, you can see the flowers up here. See the pink flowers here? That's the first Schimberkia that was given to me about 25 years ago. I still have, still have pieces of it. That's another big giant Aerides right here. Just hanging in the tree. Doesn't need any care. No care at all. There's a Schimberkia. This grew on the opposite side of the tree for many, many years and did not flower well. I moved it to this side of the tree and I have dozens of pieces that I've taken off of this plant once I put it over here because it just grew so enormous. I want to show Kiki's. Uh, here's that giant Vandopsis I wanted to show. Giant Vandopsis lysocortes that I've mentioned with the five foot flower spike. I guess you can see that now with the with the flower spike on it. Now these are Renanthras I was talking about, the red ones. They can get extremely tall. I guess that one's getting ready to flower right there, you can see. So, these are kikis I was talking about earlier, the extra plants. A lot of times you'll take these off and put them in a pot or something like that. Uh, I, I like mounting them to something getting them to grow onto something and then removing them from the actual uh, plant. These are on the old canes. You get all these extra plants on the uh, Dendrobium of Phylum. Uh, I really like growing uh, uh, a Nostrum and a Phylums. You see, I have a, just an absolutely tremendous amount of uh, these kind of plants in, in my nursery. These are all different types of, uh, a phylums and anosmums and different types of those. These are bulbophyllums across here. Grow lots of different bulbophyllums, the stinky orchids. It's a little bit of our nursery and in my yard and stuff and the different things that we grow and, and flower all the time. We have so many different types of amazing orchids from Asia and uh, learning how to grow them and uh, has uh, been a lot of fun for my wife and I over the years. Um, Matt, can you hear me? I can't hear you. You can't hear me. Now I can hear you just a little bit. Turn your volume on one second. Let's try that. Go ahead. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great. I got a couple questions. Okay. All right. Mac, during the pandemic, I was, many people are very interested. Tell, talk to us about how we can purchase from you. Uh, obviously, with no shows going on, things of that nature. Talk a little bit about maybe your website and, and how we can access you. Um, well, this is my website now. And uh, this is a new website. It's only been open, I, I guess, since the pandemic. I just opened this about a month and a half, two months ago. Um, so I'm, I'm still very new to uh, uh, making a website. And uh, um, so I have a lot more plants still to put onto this. Um, I'm planning on having well over 100 different items available in the next few weeks. Uh, we've been taking lots of photos and uh, uh, trying to prep everything and getting everything ready to drop on the website. It's not quite ready, uh, but we do have some items available for sale. We, we kind of opened it for a trial run for a while just to see what would happen. Um, and uh, since there were no shows, it was a challenge for us, of course, to regroup and, and restart. We, we did a lot of sales on eBay. We've been on eBay for a number of years now, and we've also been on Etsy for a number uh, for a while now. Uh, but I think the best place for someone to reach me would be through this website. Okay, great. Uh, another question, does vanilla berms grow here? The vanilla does grow here. I showed that in that picture, the vanilla. Uh, the I, I think that's what they meant, vanilla bean, the vanilla bean. Okay, and, beans, uh, okay. 
Yeah, I, I believe that's what they meant by that. Uh, yes, it does grow very well here. The key on that, though, is you have to pollinate that flower. It's a one day flower. And then the next day, the flower next to it opens. And then the next day, the flower next to it opens. So it's a sequential bloomer. You get many flowers one after another. Uh, but you have to pollinate that flower to actually make a vanilla bean. I, I was lucky enough when I was down at Stelmar Gardens um, a few years back, he had a 60-foot uh, vine growing up his tree, and somehow there was a natural bean that occurred on there, and I was able to get that bean about 26 foot in the air, and uh, I still have it in my Jack Daniels years later. <laughs> Mac, I don't have any more questions. Obviously, this was an outstanding presentation. Is there anything else you would like to add we, with the audience? Um, I'm sorry for the technical glitch that we have. I mean, uh, uh, I, I really miss being in front of everyone and seeing everyone, and I miss your show. And I just hope everyone stays safe and stays healthy. And, and please, please go out and vote. And uh, um, if you have any orchid questions, uh, you can reach me through AsianOrchidSource.com. You can email me at uh, MaxOrchids at AOL.com. Uh, um, I, I, I think you'll go ahead and put that on the website for me, possibly, uh, Max Orchids, And I'll have, my, I'll have you put my phone number on there, too. And uh, on Facebook also is my phone number. So if anybody has any questions or uh, wants more information about anything I spoke about tonight, please reach out to me. Excellent. Mac, again, thank you. Uh, one comment, uh, several people really liked your shirt. So, uh, oh, thanks. So thank you for that. <laughs> Mac, it was an excellent presentation. We're most appreciative of you doing this for us. Um, and remember, folks, you can locate Mac at AsianOrchidSource.com. And uh, we, were, we are hoping, Mac, that we will see you in early March at uh, the Tropical Plant Fair here at Richardson Park. Uh, if all things are go and we're keeping our fingers crossed and you and you are correct, go vote. Look forward with to it. That, I would like, yes, with that, I'd like to uh, turn this back over to our president, Van Goslin. Uh, okay, can you hear me now? Okay, yes. thank you so much, Mac. Very impressive. I, I have a number of orchids tucked away in our garden here, and none of them are that size, <laughs> not that big. It takes quite a while, quite impressive. At any rate, we're going to wrap this thing up. I'm so glad that people were able to finally get through to this thing. We had some glitches at the beginning. <clears throat> Excuse me. I just want to remember, uh, remind our members here that uh, you're going to be receiving a uh, request, some emails from the uh, Garden Club, and we're asking for your input. We want your opinions. We certainly need your permission if you are if we're going to work with the uh, native orchid plant that we really, really hope to do. So when you do get a, uh, an email from the garden, please don't ignore it. Uh, respond to it. It'll only take you a minute, and it will really make life good for all the, for the rest of us and hopefully for our communities. Um, I'd like you to stay happy, stay healthy, and I truly hope to see you soon. That would be really great. Good night for everybody, and have a wonderful evening.